if the only prayer you said in your whole life were, thank you, that would suffice. Gratitude is the great practice because it is the alternative and antidote to our ego mind's default orientation into worry and chaos. Gratitude is a kind of intention that has to do with acknowledgement of the goodness of life itself, uh, both in its great pleasurable and wonder-filling experiences, but even the experiences you wouldn't have asked for for the world, uh, still a, a deep sense of gratitude is being able to take in those uh, horrifying and, and demanding kinds of moments with a, a deeper type or at least another type of gratitude, so that the intention of being grateful in spite of all comers is a practice of this persistent intentions. Gratitude is fundamental. I wake up every morning and the, as soon as I'm, my eyes open I say, thank you. I'm awake. I'm alive. Thank you. When I take my glass of water, thank you. I have access to clean water in my kitchen and I have my whole life. I have traveled to places and been with people who don't. I'm very aware of the preciousness of fresh clean water and how easily I can obtain it. Gratitude, even for the difficulties, because it's those difficulties and that suffering that there is always, I have found much to my dismay, which I would prefer not to have the suffering, but in the suffering, I have always found a gift somewhere. You know, the poet Mary Oliver, she says, someone I once loved gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that that too was gift. And so everything is gratitude, even the sorrow. But ultimately what I love is the source of love itself. That one of the things that I sit with every day when I sit in my stillness, it's um, a sense of contemplating, contemplating this mystery. And I feel and sense that as a source of love. And so when I sit, my intention is always uh, just to be. Be with that love and allow myself to receive that love and to love in return. I don't know what that means exactly, but I feel it and I practice that every day and I find that the more I sit with that intention of receiving and giving love, the more I grow, the more depth I feel within myself and hopefully the softer, kinder heart I become. I'm going to speak about uh, someone that we call God in the Judeo-Christian tradition. There's almost as many words for God as there are people, which isn't a bad insight because uh, in my understanding this this being beyond being, whoever he, she, or it is, there is no word or concept to embrace it all. It's not overwhelming, but it's monumental. <laughs> and it insinuates everything so that this presence, perhaps is my favorite word for it, is uh, in everything, without being limited to anything. It just is. And this is the, 
the mystery that has created us with such great love so that each of us is primarily God, or at least participating in God, before we're anything else. God is more us than we are. As we were in his mind forever, and we will be with him in due time forever too. Do we need the word God at all? It's a question that comes up for a lot of people. Even to love reality, find some other word. Uh, or is the word reality enough? Uh, or, or mystery enough? Or abyss enough? Or why use the word God at all? Here's some poetry from Nikos Kazakis. We have named this abyss of mystery God because only that name, for primordial reasons, can stir our hearts profoundly. And this deeply felt emotion is indispensable if we are to touch body with body that dread essence beyond logic. I would almost like to read that again. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> but we have named this abyss of mystery God because only that name, or some name like it, of course, for primordial reasons. I mean, clear back to at least uh, something B.C. Can stir our hearts profoundly. And this deeply felt emotion, not the word God really, but this deeply felt emotion is indispensable if we are to touch body with body the dread essence beyond logic. Well, that doesn't exactly settle the matter for you, but <laughs> it at least gives you a hint <laughs> at how some people like Nikos there has decided to solve why he needs the word God. Well, here's the rub. If we use the word God for this final mysterious reality, we no longer get to decide what is good and lost, what is good and what is bad for us. Uh, reality is now deciding what's good and bad for us. Whatever is real is good, no matter how much the real is discontinuous with our preferences. So this means that the spiders are good as well as the kittens. And the hurricanes are good and the forest fires are good as well as the cool windless days. God is a word of affirmation for whatever is actually happening to your life at this moment. Van Jones tells us, tells about his visit in his latest book, his visit to the church where the pastor and eight others were killed by white man who visited their evening prayer service. Remember that story? Now, Obama went down there and gave his speech where he sang uh, Amazing Grace. Anyway, Van Jones went down for that, that event. Where South Carolina. South Carolina. Van Jones went down there and saw all this uh, celebration that was put on. And what struck him was the attitude of the people of that church uh, toward this event, that uh, they were manifesting a kind of forgiveness and a kind of uh, uh, attitude of affirmation toward this horrible thing that had happened to them that Van Jones just uh, found uh, unbelievable. And so he asked about it to some of the people in that church. And they explained to him that being happy and having joy is two different things, they said. We are, of course, not happy with the loss of this great pastor and all these friends of ours. We're not happy with that. But we can talk about joy. And they went on to talk about it with this wonderful phrase. Hallelujah anyhow. <laughs> Hallelujah anyhow. Hallelujah anyhow. <laughs> well, that's what you're what you're into in using the word God to talk about reality. Because some of these realities that come at you is going to be hallelujah 
anyhow responses, which is the joy we're talking about with New Testament joy. We're not talking about having all your neuroses comforted. We're not talking about having all your addictions affirmed. We're, we're talking about facing reality <laughs> uh, victoriously. Hallelujah. So is this devotional use of the word God biblical? That's another kind of question the skeptics of the world have talent in coming up with. So I want to spell out a few ways in which this is true to the Bible. And one of them is the name Elijah. Elijah is the, in the mythology of the Old Testament, the grandfather of all the prophets. He is the symbol figure of, of prophecy. And Elijah has a strange name because Eli means my God. And Yah means Yahweh, reality. So that's what Elijah's name means. My God is Yah. There's another word that's common in the Old Testament, Elohim. Elohim means whatever you worship. Yahweh means the void and the mystery and the demand and the fullness of, of, of eternity. So when you say, Yahweh is my Elohim, you mean reality is my God. There are a lot of other kinds of gods people worship, but Yahweh is my God. Also, the name Yahweh itself has a resonance with this uh, final reality. If you, if you pronounce it with a in-breath of the word, the syllable Yah, like Yahweh, 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 it stands for the void. If you pronounce it with the L, X breath on the Yah symbol, sim, syllable, Yahweh, Yahweh, it's a symbol for the fullness. For what? The fullness of life. The everythingness of life. So if you want to symbolize worshiping the everythingness, you say Yahweh. If you want to symbolize the void, the fact that everything falls into, it's Yahweh. <laughs> Do you get it? Tillich calls this the problem of your ultimate concern. That is, are you ultimately concerned about family, or are you ultimately concerned about your nation, or are you ultimately concerned about real reality, about being realistic in your living? H. Richard Niebuhr calls it the final trust. I mean, you trust your government, you trust your wife, you trust your children, but you don't finally trust them because they all twilight is dependable money. <laughs> but you can trust reality without limit. And so the final trust is Richard Niebuhr's way of talking about this, faith is an obedience to reality. <laughs> and that transcends anything your culture requires of you, anything your parents ever thought up for you, or you thought up for yourself. Uh, obedience to reality, that's faith for Boltmann. And for Kierkegaard, he calls it paradoxical faith. Uh, I, I like that. Anyway, the void fullness of reality is God only if it is our ultimate devotion. So if you get that word God tangled up with ultimate devotion and get reality tangled up with the kind of reality we actually face and put those two together, uh, that's going on in the Bible. Deciding to be obedient to reality and choosing gratitude as my fundamental practice toward reality is stretching me to a new place, including a new view of the word or words I use to relate to reality, to name reality. How do I do this? How do I practice? Join me on this quest. Let's play. <laughs>